This isn't about the Second Amendment. We know that. Because the Second Amendment never gave you the right to have any kind of gun you wanted. Because if it did, then you'd have a right to rocket launchers. You'd have a right to surface-to-air missiles. You'd have a right to machine guns. You'd have a right to an M1 Abrams tank, a neutron bomb, chemical weapons, atomic weapons. You don't. Right? So obviously we can draw the line. Even the people who support the right to bear arms and are the most vociferous about that, very few of them would argue that you have a right to a machine gun. Very few of them would argue that you have the right to a surface-to-air missile. That is an arm. That is a weapon, right? But we draw a line. And the point is, if we can draw a line at those weapons, it's relatively arbitrary. Why can't we draw it a little bit closer to home? Why can't we draw it around semi-automatic, high-capacity magazine, multi-shot weapons? Why can't we draw it around certain types of handguns? Well, the answer is we can and still keep in line with the Second Amendment. This is just a smokescreen argument and everybody knows it. I mean, ultimately, this isn't about self-defense and it's not about the Second Amendment because if it were just that, there would be absolutely no need for AR-15s. There would be absolutely no need for high-capacity magazine weaponry. There would be absolutely no need for guns, even just handguns that take nine shots in a clip or 12 shots in a clip. There would be absolutely no reason for any of that. You don't need any of that to defend yourself. You could defend yourself more than adequately with a you know sort of old-school double-barreled shotgun or an old-school single-shot rifle, frankly. Um, the people defended themselves for years with that. And so, so honestly, if we want to get down to what we need to do, I mean, in addition to the obvious, uh, I, th I think we ought to ban the, the production and manufacture, sale and possession of AR-15s or any kind of high capacity magazine weaponry. And there's just no need for it. And, and I know people are going to say, well, there's thousands and, and maybe millions of these in circulation. You're never going to be able to get rid of all of them. I understand. But if we had a program to have people turn those in, for instance, and I know, you know, gun buyback programs have limited success because not a lot of people participate in them. You turn in the gun, you get a couple hundred bucks, and and a lot of people aren't going to do that, particularly if they're really wedded to the idea of having a gun for self-defense or whatnot. But here, here's here's what I would propose, and I've talked about this before. How about not just a, not a gun buyback program? I mean, we could do that, but I think maybe... Uh, alternative to that would be to say, look, you you turn in these guns, these high capacity magazine weapons, whether they are high capacity handguns, whether they are assault rifles, AR-15s, whatever. And for every one of those you give us, we will gladly give you a simple old school rifle. In fact, we could encourage the production of old school rifles, high, you know, functional, perfectly functional rifles, the kind of the kind of rifles that, you know, would have been ubiquitous 50 years ago, 100 years ago. I mean, they'd be better quality, obviously, than 100. I'm not talking about antique rifles, but you know what I mean? That kind of weapon, just an old school long gun. And that way you could take all the gun manufacturers who you'd be in a sense putting out of business because they can't make these other weapons anymore. And you'd say, look, we don't want to, we're not trying to bankrupt you. We're not trying to put you out of business. We don't want to lay off all your employees. We just want you to, to get busy making the kind of weapons that people can actually use to defend themselves. Or if they're going to go hunting, they can hunt with those. They can defend themselves with those. So for every one of these weapons that we're now going to ban, you can bring it in. We will, the government will guarantee you and, and this, these companies that make the weapons will have an automatic market market, basically, uh, that they can produce for of long guns. And we will trade. It's a swap program. Or you can turn it in and get cash, whatever. Either way, uh, the government will either give you cash for it or we will uh, provide you with one of these long guns that this company is going to make. It wouldn't end the problem, for God's sake, but but it would certainly make a dent. We know in other countries, those kinds of programs have dramatically reduced. In Australia, dramatically reduced gun violence, particularly mass murder type violence. None of those since the gun confiscation slash buyback program many years ago. This would be a way to satisfy the Second Amendment purist, right? Because what we'd be saying is, look, you, you have a right to bear arms, fine. You're going to get a rifle. Even, even the rifle that we'll give you is more advanced than what the framers were actually thinking of because it actually has bullets, not musket balls. So in a sense, we're giving you something even better than they were thinking of. You can defend yourself with the rifle. And in fact, as we begin to wind down the circulation of these other weapons, I know we're not going to get rid of all of them, but we're certainly going to wind that down. You would then not need anything greater than that for your self-defense. And we could also ban the ammunition. Like, oh, you have a right to bear arms, you have a right to that weaponry. Okay, but we're not going to make any bullets for it anymore. So if you want to have an AR-15 that you can just look at and play with and pretend, that's fine. But the but the bullets that go with that are going to be banned. You're not going to be able to manufacture those. Uh, we could impose strict liability laws that say, hey, you want to you want to keep your gun? That's fine. But here's the deal. If your gun is used, first of all, you have to register it immediately. If you don't register it, you're going to face serious criminal penalty. But if your gun ends up being used, in the commission of a crime, or if your gun ends up being used 
in an accidental shooting, then you are going to face stiff criminal penalty. So we're going to have strict liability imposed upon the owner of the gun to ensure that it is not used for nefarious purposes. At the very least, what that would do is mean what? It would mean that people would have to be very, very cautious with their guns and have to keep their guns locked up, which reduces the likelihood of accidental shootings. It reduces the likelihood of suicide use of the gun. It also reduces the likelihood that someone who breaks into a house could find your gun and steal your gun. That's what happens a lot. A lot of law-abiding gun owners who don't secure their weapons weaponry, their guns end up getting stolen every year. One of the ways that a lot of legal guns end up on the street is because they get stolen by criminals who break into places. People leave them in their cars like idiots, or they leave them in a, in a dresser drawer and somebody breaks in, finds the gun, takes it. If that happens under this new law that I'm proposing, then the owner would be in serious shit. Right. So now that becomes a deterrent. I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I don't want to take any chance, man. If my gun is used in the commission of crime, I'm going to go to jail. I'd rather get rid of my gun. There are all kinds of ways like that. The gun buyback, the gun swap program, the strict liability, a lot of things like that that would incentivize getting rid of your gun. And of course, I think we ought to ban gun shows. There's absolutely no reason for these almost entirely unregulated gun shows where the notion of a well-regulated militia goes straight into the toilet in a place like that. So, you know, there are a lot of things like that that we can do. Better background checks, mental health screening, 72-hour wait periods. I mean, whatever. There's lots of stuff. And I think we ought to do all of it. But let me close with this because ultimately... We do have a problem that is, I guess you would say, concordant with the gun issue. So yes, it's the guns. The data says it's the guns. The availability of the guns is the biggest problem. But let's understand there's a reason why America has so many guns. That's not just some abstract, disconnected fact. And we have to ask ourselves, why is the United States so wedded to the gun? Because even if we ban the sale and manufacture and do all the stuff that I just mentioned and a lot of other things that you could imagine, we still got to deal with this cultural attachment that we have, unlike any other nation on earth, to guns for a particular purpose. Yeah, there are lots of guns in Canada, right? There are lots of guns in Switzerland, but they have a very different cultural understanding of weaponry. First of all, they don't have rights to weapons in those places. It's a far healthier way of dealing with it. But until we get rid of the Second Amendment uh, or have a different jurisprudence understanding of the Second Amendment, we're not going to be able to, to go quite that direction. But in addition to that, those countries, Canada, Switzerland, Australia, all the nations of Europe, really all the other nations on earth that we like to compare ourselves to, have never defined their country in as martial and warlike and weapon-like a way as the United States. We are attached to weapons because we are a settler colonial nation that is rooted in conquest and rooted in very recent conquest. I realize that most nations on earth and most nation state boundaries, right, are the result of war, are the result of conquest. But for a lot of countries, that shit goes back a really long way. It's not a fresh national memory. Um, and in the United States, because we're a young country, relatively speaking, we still have this mythos that we have ingested and internalized and is still very much a part of our active understanding of America that is rooted in what? Westward expansion, the conquest of the land, colonialism, settler frontier mentality stuff, taking the land and, and, and moving west and all of this stuff that we glorify, which involved the gun because we couldn't have settled the land and colonized the continent really without that heavy weaponry. And so in a sense, what we're dealing with is a culture that has defined the nation with reference to weaponry and with reference to the use of weaponry to control and to dominate, whether it was the land, whether it was the indigenous people who had to be run off the land, whether it was African people who had to be enslaved and held at gunpoint in order to work the land, particularly in the South, to bring forth an economy that would allow the country to function in the first place. You know, whatever it was, the, the, the weaponry that was used to steal half of Mexico in a war of aggression that this country frankly started. I mean, all of our history is rooted in that. And the way that we've taught history as a country, if you think about it, I, I doubt very seriously this has changed. And I've looked at textbooks over the years since I got out of school. And the, the stuff that we're teaching our young people is still very much a litany of narratives about war heroes and generals and battles. You know, like when we study the Civil War, we're studying the history of battles. When we study the Revolutionary War, we're studying the history of battles. It's Lexington and Concord. It's, you know, we're talking about generals and we're talking about troop movements. That's who we are as a country, much more so than any other. So our, our very notion of not just nationhood, but masculinity is tied up with that. Uh, there was an ad back in 2010, and it was placed by Bushmaster 
Firearms, one of the big firearms manufacturers. And it was an ad for an assault rifle. And the text on the ad said, consider your man card reissued. And it had a picture of this assault rifle, which you look at this weapon, there is no reason on earth for anyone to have this weapon for self-defense, for hunting, for any reason at all, other than either to go murder people or to feel like a bigger man for having it and for possessing it. What kind of sick notion of manhood is that? Consider your man card reissue. This is appealing to guys who don't feel masculine enough and somehow, you know, this gun becomes this sort of substitute phallus. No other country on earth does this shit, right? You think about how they define manhood in European nations, right? Uh, You know, you think of, I mean, you ask your typical American man whether they think Frenchmen are manly, right? And they're going to probably say no because we have this image of the Frenchman is this guy that sits around in a cafe all day wearing a beret, reading poetry and drinking coffee. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but in this country, we apparently think there is because that's not what real men do. Real men drive trucks and they go shoot shit and they eat a lot of meat and, you know, they get dirty and whatever. I mean, like we just have this imagery of manhood and the gun is very much a part of that. They don't have that imagery of manhood in Asia. So martial arts, a defensive thing. It isn't something you just break out on people to beat their ass. But here, We have this notion of masculinity, which is connected to the gun. And you've got gun manufacturers like Bushmaster in that advertisement playing upon that, knowing that there's this deep level of insecurity that haunts American masculinity, particularly American white masculinity, frankly, because they're the ones that are the most vociferous in defending weaponry and apparently seem to need it and always have because white men have been afraid, afraid of the frontier and the people they'd find there, afraid of the indigenous people who knew the land better than they did, afraid of the African people they were enslaving because they understood that if those folks got free, they were going to kick their ass because they'd been kidnapped for God's sake. So white men have been living in fear of the other since the very beginning because we knew what we were doing to other people. And so we had to impose all these systems of oppression just to keep them from getting back at us. And the gun was a really great way to do that. White American manhood has been inherently tied to guns since the beginning. We have to break that culture. And we can do that with some of these gun control measures, but we also have to do that in the way that we raise our kids. We have to teach history differently. We have to talk about manhood in a different way. We have to raise our boys differently. We have to challenge the mentality that guns are cool and they make you tough. We ought to have a public health campaign to stigmatize guns. We ought to, we ought to try to make guns as uncool as cigarettes. Remember, you know, I don't know about you. I'm, I'm almost 50 years old. I remember growing up and cigarettes were still considered cool in the eighties and in the seventies. And they were definitely considered cool in the sixties and the fifties, man. You know, you turn on a television show from those days or you, uh, you know, Twilight Zone was my favorite show. Rod Serling always was smoking a cigarette. James Baldwin, my favorite writer ever. Anytime you saw him interviewed, he was smoking a cigarette. Um, in the forties and the fifties, all the Hollywood stars, you'd see pictures of them out at the club or whatever. They always smoking cigarettes, the Rat Pack in Vegas, they're always smoking cigarettes. Cigarettes were a status symbol. Now they are like, you see somebody smoking a cigarette and it's like, oh, You know, there's like a certain grossness factor to it for a lot of people. And I know a lot of that's bound up with classism. And I don't want to like applaud that part of it because we know that disproportionately the folks who were still smoking tend to be working class and lower income. And a lot of upper middle class and affluent folks, at least in this country, in the United States have, have, have stopped smoking. So I don't want to make it like, oh, look at those dirty low class people who still smoke. But generally speaking, when you see someone smoking, there's sort of a a revulsion uh, uh, impulse. Now, a lot of young people don't think it's cool anymore. And, um, We have to have the same thing happen with guns. We need to make it so that the very idea of owning a gun, especially one of these high capacity magazine guns or multiple guns, is just seen as like, what's wrong with you? It's just, it's like there's something literally wrong. There should be a stigma associated with that. That's only going to happen. If we raise our kids differently, it's only going to happen if we teach people differently. It's only going to happen if we have a public health campaign to stigmatize guns the same way we did with cigarettes. We got to control the weapons. We also got to get a hold of our culture, which is a sick culture, not because of Hollywood, not because of rap music, all this stuff that the right wants to blame. Because, you know, during the period, frankly, that that, that hip hop became the dominant cultural form on the planet, crime has actually gone down. Violent crime is down by about half since the inception of what we call gangster rap, since the early 1990s, crime was was almost twice as high in 1991, 92, 93 as it is today. So obviously, you know, gun violence, crime in general, uh, homicides can't be can't be linked to Hollywood, can't be linked to hip hop, can't be linked to video games. Um, what it's linked to is the guns and the way in which this country uniquely on the planet relates to weaponry. We got to get a hold of that, people, because if we don't, our children are going to continue to die.
This is about the guns. This is about toxic masculinity. This is about the white blindness that continues to blind communities so often to the fact that evil can visit their neighborhoods as well. We have such stereotypes of who the dangerous people are that we end up overlooking danger or soft peddling danger or not really intervening on danger when it comes in a white face or it comes in an affluent community in a way that we would no doubt intervene if that face were black, if that face were Muslim. We just got all this stuff we got to deal with, and we better deal with all of it. Anyone who says, oh, this isn't part of the solution doesn't know what they're talking about. All of these things are part of the solution. 